So the supreme concentration is not altering the mind. It, the Tibetan says uh, Loma Chirpa, which has the idea of um, leaving the mind uh, uncontrived, not, um, the, I think the idea he's trying to do, not altering the mind, means not trying to make the mind into something artificial, not trying to uh, make it, uh, what can I say, make, make it something which is, we're trying to get back to our natural mind. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to build another mind on top of our ordinary mind. And so meditation isn't about mental gymnastics. It's about uh, letting the mind... It's like if you have a, a, a pool of water and we've been stirring it around and then all the mud and dirt and everything rise to the top and is swirling waves. So we're trying now just to settle it so that it'll, all of this just falls to the bottom and the mind becomes more clear and, and we're not adding dyes to it, we're not adding detergents to it, we're not adding chemicals to the mind. We're, we're allowing the mind to settle in its own place. Right? You understand? So it's, it's very, we're not trying to alter the mind in the sense of contriving it into some weird shapes that we think is how it should be, a um, meditative mind. Genuine concentration is allowing the mind, as I keep saying, to, to relax, but stay attentive, stay focused. So we're not adding anything on to the mind. What we're just doing is allowing the mind just to, to settle down naturally. So therefore he says that the, the real concentration, not forcing our mind to do anything, we're not forcing the mind. Like some people think the idea of when we're learning to concentrate, you tense up and you really have to, you know, no, I'm not going to think of anything except, you know, the pebble or the breath or the Buddha image or, you know, yes, I'm going to look at the mind and every thought, zap, 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 zap. <laughs> but it's not like that. That just exhausts the mind makes the mind very tense and then the mind eventually will explode. It will, you know, it's like a dog which you, you know, discipline so much that every moment is just waiting for the next order. Eventually it will turn around and bite somebody because it's, it's, it's too tense, it's, it's, it's not natural. So, like this with the mind also, we have to work with the mind. 
This is why we talk about taming the mind, taming it in a soft, friendly way. I mean, yes, we have to be firm. No nonsense here, mind. Behave yourself. <laughs> but at the same time, we have to be sympathetic towards its problems, you know, and to get the mind to want to cooperate. This is the important thing. If the mind, as I said at the beginning, if the mind really enjoys doing something, you don't have to force it. You know, it, and if you think of any activity which you do that you really enjoy, like, you know, Shuki um, playing his saxophone, he doesn't have to, you know, force himself to do it. He, he loves doing it. He loves to play music, so he plays, and it gives him joy. And likewise, you know, people enjoy reading, or they enjoy walking, or they enjoy, you know, jigsaw puzzles, or crossword puzzles, and so forth. And even though they put effort into it, it doesn't seem like effort because the mind is happy. So really to become a skilled meditator, we need to learn how to encourage the mind to enjoy. Enjoy actually being disciplined. And to enjoy the idea of how nice it would be if we could have a mind that was more peaceful and more centered, more focused. And because reminding ourselves when the mind does become like that, even if only for a short time, how pleasant that was. So in this way, we, we have to work with the mind to get the mind to want to cooperate, to want to do this, so that we're not, there's not an inner conflict Because while there is a conflict, I mean, in the beginning, as with most things, you know, yeah, we don't, yeah, we do want to do it, but we don't. But after a while, if you know, if there is still a conflict, then we should really work out what's the problem here. Because, as I say, anything that we we do with our heart, as well as our head, is is easy, even if outwardly it looks like very difficult. Other people look and say, wow, how can you do that? So difficult. But for the person doing it, it's not difficult because the difficulties are irrelevant, because there's a, a, a joy in doing it. So likewise, you know, learning how to become the the masters of our own mind it's not easy because the mind rebels. And so either we can beat it into submission and have a very unhappy mind, but still, you know, it will do what we tell it. Or we can encourage it to uh, recognize the benefits of being well tamed and how then we can train the mind. So this is by learning to use the natural resources of the mind. The mind by its nature can be quiet and it can be focused. We are not trying to make it go into strange, um, you know, str str as I say, you know, weird yoga poses of the mind. You know, the... the where the, the good yoga poses, the genuine yoga poses, go with the body and just stretch it. And so likewise we are going, working with the mind, but just stretching it. And then the mind becomes relaxed, flexible, supple, workable, instead of being hard and obdurate and difficult. But it's all part of, I'm not answering any questions, by the way. We have to get through this whole text, which is a long text. I've given up on questions. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Good. All comments. <laughs> we are trying to make our mind workable. We are trying to get the mind back to how it should be if we didn't mess it up along the way. Which would be open and clear and calm and focused. That is how the mind should be. We're not changing the mind into something else. We are getting the mind back to how it would be if it were worked well, if it was well functioning. So therefore it's very important not to try to, to um, alter the mind in the sense of um, being artificial. but just to work back towards, as I say, like water. You know, if you leave it alone, then it will settle of itself and clear. So good concentration is like that. Just allows, we don't try to settle the mind. We just give the mind an object and the mind will settle of itself. So this is the point with meditation that we are developing this quality of recognizing. The, the important thing to recognize is the conceptual mind of thinking. Right? The thinking mind is not what is meditating. It's another mind, our mindfulness, awareness. And eventually down. So we don't have to alter that. We don't have to change our. You understand? I'm using our thinking mind to. This is why. we could only have one moment, mental moment at a time. So therefore, even though it goes so fast that we can't divide them, but the point is that the more moments of concentration we have, the less moments of discursiveness we have. That's why we don't have to alter the mind. As we become more aware, more conscious, naturally, the background chatter will begin to die down. We don't have to force it. So the more concentrated the mind, the more silent the background noise becomes. We don't need to turn down the volume. It turns itself off. So therefore he said that, you know, that the highest uh, concentration is not, not to alter the mind. We're not dealing with the law, with the, the surface mind. We don't need to change that. All we need at this point is just 
to develop our powers of staying one-pointedly on one object. But not with a tense mind, I repeat, with a very open, spacious mind, very spacious, feeling of being relaxed, not that it's all tight, but very open and relaxed, but at the same time, the attention very focused. Then the rest happens of itself automatically. You don't have to do anything. So this is the, the, the point I, th I think that he's trying to make here, is that you, we don't have to change the mind. We don't have to try to, uh, you know, artificially alter it in any way. The mind will take care of itself if we just hone our attention within a very relaxed, open, spacious sense of being. And so, really, it just needs patience and perseverance. The, the actual principle is very, very simple. <coughs> the main problem is that our mind, um, you know, likes to chatter away, and then we get fascinated again by the chatter and swept along. So we have to be, you know, like with a very naughty, fractious child, you know, you know, be a little firm, but not get caught up in arguing with our discursive mind. This is very important. Let it scream and chatter in the background, because in the foreground, we have our object of meditation, which we are focused on. And so, as we ignore the background noise of itself, it begins to calm down because nobody's interested. <laughs> Coming up with all sorts of fascinating thoughts. <laughs> and so then after a while, <laughs> and if we ignore it, mind likes to have attention, and if we don't give it attention, after a while it just gets bored and, <coughs> and quiet and stand. Curls up, goes to sleep. So this is the, the point with meditation, is just to take it very easily, step by step, and uh, not try to make even while one is sitting, one should sit, you know, one should sit nicely, of course, but still not, not trying to make the mind kind of contrived. It, it's very natural, not big thing about, now I'm going to meditate, right, I'm a meditator. But just to sit, and, and sit nicely, and then just turn the focus to whatever, you, like nothing special. You know, just like when we're reading a book, we don't say, oh, now I'm a reader. Wow, I can read. <laughs> you, know? you know, you just read a book because we read a book, you know. So we just sit down and look at the mind because we sit down looking at the mind. Big deal. <coughs> So this one on wisdom is actually something which we have already dealt with on a number of occasions. Above and someone's gone saying, why is Atisha still saying this? Uh, the supreme wisdom is not to grasp onto anything as the self. So we did the supreme understanding is to realize the meaning of selflessness, and then the supreme remedy is to know that nothing has self-nature. Now we have the supreme wisdom is not to grasp onto anything as a self. <coughs> yes, so every time he, he uses slightly different words, but always the, the, um, the, the idea is this. 
idea that we make something into, um, as we were explaining this morning, into something solid and real and self-existent from its own side. Um, I think Atisha says this again and again in various ways because um, from the point of view of uh, Buddhist wisdom and attainment, this is the crucial point. Both from the point of view of as an individual, our, our belief that we really are a self-existent, enduring, changeless I at the center and that likewise everything outside also are very separate and discrete and enduring and solid and real just how we perceive them to be and so again and again and again comes back to the same point things are not how we perceive them and because we perceive things in as something very solid and real and enduring that we have to relate to ourselves and others, this uh, creates all our problems. Because as we said before, again and again, those things which appear to this seeming I as pleasurable, we reach out for, we grasp, we hold on to, we're attached to, and those things which seem to be so real and existent outside of this real existent me, which appear as if they are a cause of, of pain to us in any way, then we react with aversion, with anger, with hatred, and we push them away. So we spend our whole life caught between pleasure and pain, <coughs> attracting pleasure, warding off pain. And this creates a lot of problems. It causes a lot of problems for ourselves, causes a lot of problems for other people. And it's all based on the fact that we don't see things as they really are. And so, there are two things always going on. One is that on a relative level, we are trying to basically become nicer people. Right? We are trying to cultivate kindness, generosity, patience, <coughs> loving kindness, compassion, we are trying to live in this world more peacefully, thinking of others' happiness, apart from only thinking of our own happiness. If people are difficult to us, trying to deal with that skillfully so as not to make more problems all around, and so forth. We are, in fact, trying to make a, a more peaceful, kinder, and more beneficial self. So that is on the relative level, on our conventional truth, that we are taking our ego along on the path, and so we want a happy little ego. Right? We, we want a sense that, you know, this, this self that we are having to walk on the path with because we cannot actually completely drop the self till we are at a very advanced level, that this self is a helpful self and not a detrimental one which causes problems for, for themselves and on the spiritual path and for other people. So, on the relative conventional level, we are trying to develop good qualities which bring us closer to our true nature <coughs> and at the same time to clear away, recognize and, and clear and transform those negative qualities which are, are not inherent to our nature but are badly learned habitual patterns which we need to uh, eradicate eventually and to transform 
which can happen because <coughs> it is not part of our inherent nature, that we are not naturally bad. We are all really very, very naturally good. And so we have to therefore work to come back to our innate goodness. Mm -hmm. So that is still all on a very conventional level. But at the same time, there is this other thing happening, which is to try to help us to understand the ultimate nature of reality, which is, is to open us up to how things really are. Always underlying everything is how things seem with our deluded perception, and how things really are if only we had the eye of wisdom. So these two things are developing at the same time, as I said, like they're like the wings of a bird in a way also, because along with this understanding of wisdom comes the cultivation of all these very positive qualities which we need in this world. But wisdom is something which we can think about it. Like we talk a lot in Atisha is again and again talking about a lack of self, self-existence, a lack of self-being, that we are not who we think we are. Others are not who they appear to be. That actually we are so much more than what we think, as well as so much less. I mean, the problem is that we identify with all the wrong things. There's nothing wrong with thinking. I am so and so, and I, I, you know, I'm male or I'm female, and I'm, I'm an engineer or I'm a doctor, or you know, I'm a house decorator or whatever you are. There's nothing wrong with thinking I belong to this religion, this race, this nation. We need that to live in this world. The problem comes when we believe it and when we identify with that only, thinking this is who I truly am and not recognizing that yes, there is there, but that is something which is very impermanent, always changing, and beyond that is something so much more that we haven't recognized. This is why wisdom and compassion go together. Because as one really begins to see our genuine nature, and one looks at everybody around and, and oneself also, and how we trapped we are, in, in not understanding the real situation, who we truly are. It's so sad. We have this incredible potential. We all have Buddha nature and we don't know. <coughs> we think we're something ordinary. We think we're something, you know, flawed. We, we don't recognize. You know, the traditional um, <coughs> explanation is of a beggar who lives in a hovel, in, a, in just a very poor hut. And underneath the ground in his hut, there is this huge treasure buried. But he doesn't know. So he goes out every day and he earns a few points and he's so happy he's got a little bit enough for the next meal. And all the time he's a multimillionaire. But he doesn't know. then that's very sad. And so that's our situation. That we all have this great treasure within us, but we think we're poor. But we can only get to this treasure when we stop identifying with what we are not. This is why there is all this emphasis on no self, no self, no self. 
doesn't mean we don't exist. It means we, that we should stop identifying so strongly with our present personality, our present. I mean, next lifetime when you get reborn as Palestinians, yeah. you are going to be glad that you work for peace in this lifetime. <laughs> And all those people who are thought of as being enemies are going to be your nearest and dearest. And those people who now are your nearest and dearest, you will think of as your enemies. Happens like that. <laughs> so, you better discover right now that you're not who you think you are. <laughs> and so it's all genuine spiritual traditions, genuine spiritual traditions have understood that what is blocking us from recognizing our <coughs> innate divinity, however you want to call it, is this idea of clinging to the small self. None, nobody is as relentless about it as the Buddhists, but all genuine spiritual teachings understand that, that something else has to take place. I mean, as St. Paul said in one of his letters, it is not I that act, but Christ that acts in me. And, and that's what we're talking about. Dropping the sense of the little self, the little ego, and something so much greater taking place. This, this primordial awareness, which is luminous. Luminous clarity. We wake up. So the talk about no self, no self, no self, is not in the least bit negative. It's really very positive. We are trying to clear away so that we can see clearly our true nature, which is, is so beyond thought, literally. And when we awaken to that, that is wisdom. Because then we wake up and we see things as they really are. Of course, we probably fall back to sleep again. <laughs> but that initial waking up is, is considered very important in, in all Buddhist traditions. That first glimpse of a reality beyond our ordinary, everyday, concept, conceptual, conventional mind. That, that for a moment the clouds open and we see the sky. Then, then one understands. You know, yes, or then you start working, you know, then it has to be that we start really trying to get glimpse after glimpse after glimpse and, and, and you know, make those, those glimpses longer and more continuous. Yes, that's when the real work starts. But nonetheless, it, it, that first initial breakthrough is very important because then one recognizes that there is something genuine and what we are seeing is, is, is a counterfeit, almost. So far from seeming like very um, negative, you know, all this talk about no self and emptiness and all this, actually it, it's dealing with really opening up to something which is literally beyond words and beyond thought. And far from repudiating the world, the world suddenly comes alive in, in all its intelligence in a way that we normally, with our small, limited, conventional thinking, cannot imagine. This is why it's worth this is why we were able to do this game. And the nettles and turn green. <laughs> because he was 
in search of the infinite. But in the meantime, be kind, be patient, be generous, really care about others. And, and laugh. I have always said that a sense of humor is the seventh parameter. <laughs> We take ourselves too seriously. You know, a sense of humor is very good to have. Don't take ourselves too seriously. Yes, sincerely. We are sincere, but not too serious. <laughs> so, um, we're, the Supreme Spiritual Teacher is the one who exposes our hidden flaws and the Supreme Instruction is the one that helps us to strike at those flaws. So, mm -hmm. to learn. It's no good having a teacher who only praises us and never points out anything that we're doing wrong. Again, it's like if we are learning a, a musical instrument or if we're learning a sport or if you have a trainer at a gymnasium or anything, any skill that we want to acquire, we expect our teachers to point out our faults. That's why we need a teacher. <coughs> because otherwise we could just read it all on an instruction book or Google it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what we need is, is an actual person to show us, no, you're, you're doing that, you're not doing that right. You know, you're not putting your fingers, have to go like this, not like that. And uh, whatever skill we're trying to learn, we need someone to, who <coughs> knows much better than we do who can see how we're doing it wrong? As well as, of course, encouraging us when we do it right. I mean, we don't want someone who's endlessly criticizing and, and, and never, you know, encouraging us when it, it's fine. But more important is that they show us when we're going, we're, we're not doing it properly. So when it comes to a spiritual teacher who is um, in the uh, Kadampa, tradition is called our Gevi Shenyen, that is our Kalyamanitra, our good friend. That's what it literally means, it means a good friend. The good friend is one who points out to us what, what flaws we have in our character that need to be looked at. Because very often we can see some things, but other things are, are glaring and we just don't see it. So the, a good teacher is like a mirror for us, pointing out uh, where our weaknesses are, where the flaws are in our nature. Because without that, it's very hard for us to always see where, where, where we're going wrong. Nowadays, of course, it is much more difficult to have that kind of relationship with teachers. Um, you know, if you do have a teacher who you do can talk with and, and communicate with, you, you're very, already very, very fortunate. Because, um, you know, nowadays, certainly the, 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 so many uh, lamas are running around the world continually, zap, zap, zap. And, uh, you know, the, the chance of people actually getting to sit down and talk with them about their practice, even if they're their students, it is really quite minimal. 
Um, even in India, you know, the llamas are so busy, they've got so many projects on, and then they're always running all over the place, and then they have so, if they're popular, they have so many students, and so if you have a, a, a teacher who is quite well known, the chances of getting more than, you know, five minutes is, is you know, very unlikely. And so it's actually quite difficult now to have a teacher that you can really sit down and talk with and who has the time to hear what your problems are and who knows you well enough to be able to point out your faults. I mean, if the lamas only see you when you're sitting there all nice and pious, <laughs> you know, in, in your da in Dharma talk, uh, how can he know what you're really like? very hard. So if you are in a situation where you do have a teacher who really is there with you and gets to know you and, and can help you, then that is a, a wonderful blessing, actually. And of course, you know, as with if you're learning an instrument, uh, you don't need to have, you know, the very, very top professional players. Uh, teaching you. Sometimes somebody who is just very proficient, but not, you know, a, a, a superstar, <laughs> is actually better. <coughs> and uh, as long as they they have, you know, they, they have the qualities of having practiced for a long time and, and basically, you know, being very clear about what is Dharma, what is not Dharma, provided they, they have a good and compassionate heart and their motivation really is for benefiting others and, you know, propagating Dharma, that is more than enough. I mean, somehow people imagine that if only they could find, you know, the teacher sitting on a thousand petal lotus radiating lights that they would just look at them and that they got it. But it isn't like that. I mean even if the Buddha himself was sitting here, all he could say is practice. What could he say? <laughs> he can't I mean if he could do it for us he would, but he can't, you know. All he could say is look this is what you have to do, now go away and do it. So for that, you don't need a Buddha on a thousand petal lotus. Sometimes it's much better to have somebody who just has accomplishments but is not anybody super, super high, because then they understand us so much better. And we can talk to them. And they know what we're talking about. So the important thing is to have somebody that you can turn to and who <coughs> can understand us enough that when we are going, you know, going astray or when we have problems which we are obviously not dealing with, that they can point these out to us. This is very, very helpful, of course, in any skill. You have a teacher. We know that. So also for the Dharma, you need teachers. And in Israel, you have teachers. You do. And so the, the point is therefore to, to make use of that on one hand, and also the point to practice. The teacher cannot do it for us, but what they can do is to help guide us so that we do things properly and we don't waste time by doing things wrong. And beyond that, it's up to us. So then also, <coughs> supreme instruction, is one that strikes at those flaws. So again, we need, if we, for example, are, are very short-tempered, if we get angry very easily, if we, you know, if that, that root of anger is, is the strongest in our mind stream, we need teachings which deal with that. 
such as you know learning loving kindness and patience and many meditations which can help deal with that particular root so if we are angry but generous we don't need so much instructions on how to be generous because we already know that bit but what we need is something which will strike at our particular problem whatever that problem may be and everyone has different problems a, a skillful teaching will be one which will help us to deal with that particular problem that particular flaw in in our personality so again a skillful teacher uh, could help us to find the kind of practice which speaks most to our difficulties because um, it's, it's important that our, our nature becomes well balanced and there are many 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 practices and different practices are useful for different people it's not that there is a, a universal <coughs> practice I mean we usually start by getting everybody in uh, you know, concentrating on the breath or on the image of the Buddha, etc., just as a general, um, you know, just to get the mind tamed. But then after that, there are so many different practices and different people respond to different uh, approaches and different techniques depending on, uh, on their own personality and their own needs. So therefore, it's important especially to hear and think about and practice those instructions which especially hit at our weak points. As I say, it's like going to a gymnasium. If you have strong arms but flabby legs, then you will work mostly on machines which strengthen legs. You don't need to keep strengthening your arms and neglecting the legs because then you'll have extremely super arms and, and fall over on your face because your legs are so flat. So you need to balance, right? You work, the trainer, if he's a good trainer, will immediately look at you and tell you what's wrong. And you don't resent that being told you know that you know what's wrong with you that's why you've got a trainer because the trainer can immediately look and see what's wrong and then give you exercises to uh, counterbalance that <coughs> and strengthen the weaknesses i mean this is obvious so likewise um a, a skilled teacher will be able to see if they know the student they can see where are their strong points where are their weak points and especially encourage them to look at their weak points and then use uh, uh, some practice and study which will direct them at their weak points in order to overcome them and transform them So therefore, definitely, um, one should not uh, be offended by criticism. And even in the world, when uh, people criticize us, rather than becoming defensive and angry, we should look at what they're saying and say, is it true? Are they pointing out to us some fault in ourselves which we haven't perhaps noticed in which case we are grateful they have become our teacher and if when the, we have criticism we look and we don't see that that is a fault actually you know honestly looking we can't see how they projected that onto us that wasn't we have many faults but maybe not that one then we don't have to worry. We just drop it. So, no, not that one. Try another. <laughs> Next time, mention that so and so. Then, nah, that will hit. <laughs> so it's very important to to have a a very clear 
and balanced understanding of our, uh, you know, our, our conventional nature, what work needs to be done. And so that is, 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 is our part, is, is dealing with what needs to be done and doing it. And so therefore, as he's saying, you know, the teacher who shows us what work needs to be done is, is the best teacher. And the instruction for helping us to deal with those problems is the best instruction. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, then he said, the supreme companions are mindfulness and alertness. So again, we're back to this question of mindfulness. Uh, it means, I mean, nowadays, of course, mindfulness has become a big catchword everywhere in business, in psychology, in you know, for stress relief and lowering your cholesterol <laughs> and, and for everything, uh, you know, you learn to be mindful. And, and basically it's regarded nowadays, the way it's taught is that it means being um, present in, in the moment. So that what we are doing, what we know what we are doing while we are doing it, so that we are present. And this is a, an important quality of mindfulness, but it's not the only thing. And from a Buddhist perspective, that's only one aspect of mindfulness. In fact, Buddhism doesn't just talk about mindfulness, it talks about right mindfulness. I mean, if one were uh, uh, a burglar <coughs> about to enter a house or to open up a safe uh, where there are people in, in the room above, then one is very mindful, right? One moves, opens up the window very, very quietly, carefully, and get, enters the room, one moves very, very carefully and one is taking what one wants to take very silently. It's all very mindful. But from a Buddhist perspective, it's not right mindfulness. Because right mindfulness is always connected with positive states of mind. And so part of the the practice of mindfulness is that we are conscious of our states of mind and we are checking to make sure that they are positive states and not negative states. And if they are negative, we change them. So this, this quality of checking up is part of what is called alertness. This word alertness doesn't really have any uh, translation into English. In Tibetan it's Kusheshin. And it goes along with a trempa, which is mindfulness. So it's trenche probably. Trenpa Dan Sheshin. So we are trying to become more conscious, more present, and at the same time there is this aspect of our mind which kind of looks to see how the mind is getting on. During meditation, during strict sitting meditation, 
then this this quality of what he is calling here alertness. Some people say introspection, some people say clear comprehension, whatever we call it, this session, quality of the mind. While we are sitting in meditation, we are developing mindfulness. Mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness of the, the mental stream, mindfulness of a pebble, mindfulness of a Buddha image, whatever. We're developing mindfulness awareness. And at that time, this alertness quality of the mind looks up from time to time, perks up, looks, sees. Is the mind distracted? You know, we've forgotten to be mindful, we're off, you know, having our summer holidays in, in wherever we're having our summer holidays. Or has the mind sunk, <coughs> so we are in this nice, pleasant <laughs> samadhi of sleep? <laughs> in either case, this, this quality of alertness notices what's happening in the mind. Is it, is it fallen into either extreme? And it rectifies it. You know, if the mind is very distracted, then it brings it firmly back to the object. If the mind is sinking, then, you know, it again tries to vivify the mind, brighten the mind, and so forth. So this is the quality that it's, it's looking during formal meditation to make sure that our mindfulness is, is clear and steady and balanced. Now during the day, while we are cultivating mindfulness in daily life, of course at that time what the alertness is doing, what this, this watching, it's not there the whole time, it just looks and when it sees something which needs adjusting, it adjusts it, then it subsides again. And then after a time, it will come back up and look again. But it doesn't keep disturbing the mind. It doesn't make the mind look tense. Just from time to time, it checks up. It checks up. So during the day, we are attempting to be more conscious. The Buddha said, when we are standing, we know we are standing. When we are sitting, we know we are sitting. When we are walking, we know we are walking. When we are lying down, we know we are lying down. In other words, step number one is to get in contact with our bodily postures. This is the easiest thing because the, the body is, is you know, the way we experience it at the beginning is very gross. It gets more and more subtle as we become more and more in, in contact with the, the energies of the body. But at the beginning, step number one is just dealing with our basic four postures. Standing, walking, sitting, lying down. And so this catches our attention. We, when we're walking, we can experience walking. Normally when we're walking, we're thinking a thousand other things, not walking. Now we are just going to bring the attention to the experience of movement. Or if we're sitting, then we're sitting. And then whatever we're doing, there's that quality of knowing as much as possible what we are doing while we're doing it. And then gradually that develops also into the, um, into the knowing about the mind. Now, especially while knowing about the mind, but also with the, the, uh, the postures, again, this checking quality of the mind is seeing what's going on. So if we are, are 
uh, our posture, for example, is 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 not is not good, then we can sit properly, we can stand properly. But especially, and what it really is in, interested in is what's going on in our mind. <coughs> So while we're watching the mind, we're more conscious of what's happening in the mind. The Shishin checks it. Is, it. is it positive or negative? And if it's negative, then again, we recognize it. We can name it. Very short, as I say, anger, envy, greed. Then we can either just drop it or we can work with it to transform it. If it is a positive quality in the mind, then we can encourage it. If the mind is just neutral, not positive or negative, we note it. So it's this ability to be bring our everything which we do in our day in conformity with the path, and it's developing the mind the whole day. Because if we think that sitting for half an hour in the morning, and then the rest of the mind, day, the mind is, is running all over the place, that we are actually ever going to learn to meditate, we are fooling ourselves. It's not going to work. We, we have to be in training with our mind as much as we can remember during the day. So this is why we were talking about mindfulness spells. And anything that we can think of to do which will remind us. You know, the word for uh, mindfulness, both in Sanskrit and in Tibetan, is the ordinary word to remember. The word to remember. Nga payula I am remembering my my homeland. It's an ordinary colloquial Tibetan. Tren Trenpa just means to remember. And so its direct uh, enemy is that we forget. Actually, if I ask you now to be mindful of your, your posture, of your body in this moment, you can do it. You, you suddenly become very conscious of the body and, and the energies in the body. If one says, well, be mindful of your hand, then immediately your attention goes to the hand, you begin to feel the blood pulsing through the hand, the energy in the hand. Not difficult. Anybody can do that. The problem is we don't remember. We forget. And we get carried away by our mind stream and we forget to remember. <coughs> so this again is why this, this quality of, of of alertness or session is helpful if we develop it because it, if it pops up then it can see that look mindfulness where's it gone you know and, and bring it back the Buddha said that this is the one path to liberation in Tantra for those of you who are practicing people are practicing here so in Tantra, the way they do it is by um, the self-generation of oneself as the Buddha, Bodhisattva, the deity, which one carries with one throughout the day. Right? It's not just when you're sitting down on your cushion meditating that, for example, one sees oneself as, uh, well, as the Buddha here. You know, then uh, it's not just when you're meditating that you would see yourself as the Buddha or as uh, Chen Resik or whoever, Tara. But at the end, when all the visualization 
has been uh, dissolved back into emptiness, into primal level of the mind, <coughs> then again one appears as the deity. And all sound is mantra, all thoughts are the play of the wisdom mind of the deity. And all beings become the deity. I mean, often in, in, in Chenrezig or Tara practice, then all males become Chenrezig or females become Tara, however you want to see it. But the point is that then, if you're the deity, well, that changes everything, doesn't it? <laughs> and this, if one does it seriously, we, we are serious. One has to understand that by seeing oneself as a deity, one is actually coming closer to how things really are than just seeing ourselves as a more sentient being. For example, Sunma Alien here is going to be meditating on Tara. Everybody know who Tara is? She is um, often, uh, she, she has uh, two, she has 21 forms, but the two main ones, one is uh, green, one is white, and she represents uh, fearless compassion. And she is a very, very popular um, bodhisattva who, uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, who is practiced by all, um, thank you, who is practiced by everybody, male, female, high, low, everybody. That's Tara. Our nuns do a Tara puja every morning. So if one is seeing oneself as Tara, so Sunma Aileen is going to sit down and see herself as Tara. She visualizes her body um, transform, uh, dissolving into light, and then in an instant she appears as Tara. But in the back of her mind is the thought, right, well, of course, really, I'm, I'm Aileen, and now I'm going to pretend to be Tara. Right now, I'm, I'm going to be Tara, but of course, really, I'm Aileen. But so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is what we, we're thinking, you know, right, I'm me, but I'm going to pretend to be this one now. And that, you see, that is our fundamental delusion. Because, of course, actually, we are Tara, pretending to be Amy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the point. So it's always in, in Vajrayana, it's called the pride of the deity, recognizing that we are the deity, this is who we really are, and we're mistaken. This is our enduring identity. This other identity we've taken on for this lifetime is, is just very impermanent. We, we have at the most a hundred years and then we're something else. But part of nature endures forever. So, the, the practice of seeing oneself as the deity throughout the day it's very powerful because, you know, then not only one's, one's form is, is the, the deity, but one's mind is the deity. One's actions are the deity. And all other beings, likewise, are, are, are the deity. It's not that it's just I and Tara and everybody else is just ordinary, funky, sensual beings. <laughs> All beings are Tara. Isn't that wonderful? They might manifest in, in different ways, but every breathing that we see is Tara. And they just don't know it. And so this is the, the Vajrayana way of maintaining mindfulness. All sounds, pleasing sounds, 
disturbing sounds, all sounds are her mantra. Om Tari, Ti Tari, Ture Swaha. All thoughts, high thoughts, low thoughts, wise thoughts, stupid thoughts, all just the clay of her wisdom mind. They're all empty in their nature. So this is the, the tantric way of coming back to who we really are. It reminds us the whole time that we are, you know, yes, we are playing our role that we have been assigned in this lifetime, but it's, it's not who we really are. We're something so much more. We are the wisdom mind manifesting in the form of a deity. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So this is why it is considered in a, in a tantra, you know, apart from also the you know, manipulation of the inner energies and so forth, that tantra is a very fast path because it takes the, the fruit of the path, which is our Buddhahood, and takes it to use it as the path. Rather than thinking of ourselves as flawed sentient beings walking along until finally we become a Buddha, we recognize we are all actually innately Buddha if only we understood that, realized that. So then we take that fruit, that with the goal which we are striving, and use it as the actual path. And so in this way, uh, if we do it sincerely, uh, it, it very quickly uh, transforms our, our consciousness. Because we're trying to see things as they really are, and not as we see them normally <coughs> in, with our deluded perception. <coughs> so, However we practice, the, the fundamental point, which he's saying here, is to have as our companions. As, in other words, we, what accompanies us on the path the whole time, whatever our path, is the ability to be aware. So we can start with small things. The Buddha suggested you know, the, the four fundamental postures of the body as a start. We could also take uh, actions which we do every day and normally we do very mindlessly and make the determination to do them mindfully. Uh, anything, you know, drinking, every time you drink a cup of tea or a cup of coffee makes the, the inner commitment to do so, being as, as conscious as possible. Or cleaning your teeth, brushing your hair, if you walk to work, then when you're walking use that as a meditation. Any especially simple actions which we do, normally, automatically, and as an excuse for thinking something else while we're doing it, now we can use that as uh, the foundation for a practice. And in itself, again, as I say, it, it's very easy, you know? I mean, we can say, all right, when I... I you know, when I comb my hair, I'm going to comb it and be conscious I'm combing it. And in itself, that is very simple. The, the main problem is, well, the two main problems. First main problem is that we're doing this, you know, and we're, we're aware that we're combing our hair or cleaning our teeth or drinking tea or whatever. And then, the mind says, oh yes, look, I am mindfully 
combing my hair. <laughs> well, now look, it's easy to comb your hair mindfully. Look, I'm being really very mindful. I don't know why people think mindfulness is difficult. Here I am combing my hair, and I know I'm combing my hair. Blah, 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 blah. I wonder if it needs tinting. <laughs> And so this is the main problem that, uh, you know, it's, it's, in the beginning it's difficult to maintain uh, mindfulness without uh, the, you know, the conceptual mind uh, jumping in there and, and giving its commentary. <laughs> but again, it's a matter of, of practice. You know, and relaxing, and just yes, yes, we heard that. Now just go back to combing the hair. Right? <laughs> and the other thing, of course, is that the first one or two times we do it, and we say, oh yes, this is good, this is nice, you know. And then we go back completely <laughs> next time, even though we know it was good and we could do it and it was fine and that was nice, but you know, we don't keep it going. We forget. We forget because the mind's habit is not to be present. The ego, the, the self itself, cannot be present. The ego thrives in the past and in the future. Just watch your mind and we see how it is not going to be here. It's always going to be in the past or in the future or running around the present, commenting but just settled, observing, without comment. Can't do it. Another level of the mind comes in that can do it. In fact, that's all it can do, is be present, which is mindfulness. We can only be mindful of the past and the future if we uh, look at the mind knowingly that this is we are thinking now in the past or we are planning in the future. That we can be mindful of. But then we know that's what we're doing. But when <coughs> the mind itself just gets carried away in the past and the future without us being even <coughs> conscious that's what we're doing, then that is not mindfulness. Right? So, the ego is always going to live anywhere except now. And so, therefore, mindfulness is such a brilliant way of really learning how to live <coughs> without the ego always being there the whole time. And therefore the mind feels very rested, actually, <coughs> clean. Even if we only stay mindful for a short time, it's a tremendous relaxation for the mind. Just to be present with what we're doing, without commenting, without judging. I mean, judging only as far as to make sure that when we, if we are mindful of the mind, the mind is in a a very positive state of mind. But when we are training just to learn how to be present, we just need to allow our minds to relax and just bring the focus, as in our meditation, just bring the focus to the forefront of the mind. It's very easy, I and mean, one, one feels the whole shift in focus. The minute we are really focused on the present, it's like everything comes into, a sh you know, like the lens of a camera suddenly becomes very sharp. Because we are using a more subtle level of the mind. The gross level of the mind is our ordinary, you know, the waves of our conceptual thinking running along. Mindfulness is a, a more subtle level. Of course, it's all mind, but it's a more subtle level of the mind. 
So therefore it's much sharper. Much clearer. But the ego sees it as a threat, which it is to the ego, and therefore will do everything it can to get in the way again. And this is why it needs practice. We are in the habit of being unmindful. And to develop the, the quality of being present, of, of knowing what is happening at the time of happening with as least commentary as possible. Because then also we see everything fresh. Normally when we see things, the mind immediately compares it with what it's seen before. And evaluates it according to its previous experience. We do it so automatically, we're not even conscious of it. And mostly what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we touch, can be put into compartments of received um, experiences from the past, so that we immediately decide, automatically it seems, we like it, we don't like it, this is better, this is not so good, etc., etc. We don't see the thing in itself. We see our opinion. And this is why also as one gets older, time seems to speed up. As a child, every experience is new and vivid. And, and so therefore, time, one day, seems to go on forever. But as we get older and our mind just becomes acclimatized and habituated, so it seems like one day into the next day into another, it's all like the real is speeding up. And, and this is actually a very bad sign. <laughs> because it, it shows that we are not living every moment anew. Our senses are dulled. So this quality of mindfulness actually brings back the vividness of our experience. So that, in fact, we do see each thing as if it, it was for the first time. I mean, even though, you know, we can still evaluate and we like this and we don't like that, but still there is a, a more immediate relationship with what is happening. And we are also conscious that these things are just being received through the senses and they are being programmed. It's like having, it's a bit like being in a, a, a room which is empty and all the windows and doors are open so the winds are blowing through but nothing is obstructing it. So the mind is very open and empty and spacious and aware without being cluttered with lots of furniture and adornments. It's just, it just very things coming in and going out without getting um, trapped. So it's a very balanced, open, spacious mind. Very clear. Colors appear clearer. Sights appear clearer. Sounds appear clearer. Everything is much more vivid. Doesn't the, the ego benefit from it? Why did you say that the ego is threatened by mindfulness? Because the ego cannot live in the, the present moment. It can comment on the present moment, but it, it cannot live silently in the present moment. What lives silently in the present moment is our awareness. Our awareness 
is not part of the ego. So therefore, as our mind becomes more and more habituated to being in a state of, of clear awareness, the ego begins to diminish. And so, therefore, the ego recognizes that this is part of its dissolution process. And therefore, it, it comes up with everything it can to uh, de distract us, including and especially the fact that it causes, keeps trying to make us forget by um, bringing up something else which um, will take us away from remembering to remember. Why, why the ego doesn't like that we are in the present moment? Because when we are in the present moment, there's no ego. So if we stay always in the present moment, that's the death of the ego. So of course, even though ultimately the ego has never existed from the very beginning, right? So you're not killing. <laughs> We're dissolving something which from the very beginning has just been a fabrication of our ignorance. But nonetheless, the habitual tendencies of the mind resist letting go. And this is why we have to really make a commitment. This is why people do retreats. This is why people go into group retreats. It's to try to retrain our minds a bit, you know, so that we can even just get a taste so that we can understand what it is we need to do. It's very hard sometimes to just jump straight in to the practice if one hasn't got some kind of a slight foundation at least, even if it's only a, a week-long retreat or 10-day retreat. Um, it, it gives a kind of idea, a, a taste of what the mind could do if it only was, was trained properly and how nice that would be. People come out, even of 10 days, uh, you know, Vipassana retreats, I mean, they're crying and laughing at the same time. And, uh, you know, they, they think, wow, how come I never knew about this before? They're, they're so amazed that their mind can actually do it. Wow! You know, everybody else, of course, is sitting in samadhi. But me, you know, I have my troubles in mind. I'm the only one that has ever had a problem with their mind. <laughs> <laughs> but then as the mind begins to settle and, and move into deeper levels, people recognize that actually they can do it. Wow. Huh. And so then, you know, when they come out, they, they feel such <coughs> um, a confidence that they can walk the path. Yes, it's possible. Even me, I could do it. If I put enough effort into it, I can do it. So this is... Uh, but then in... So often after that, then people just plunk again because they, they're not maintaining that momentum. And this, of course, is the problem, you know, to keep maintaining it and really try to cultivate awareness in, in our daily life as much as possible in order to really transform our mind. You know, the beauty of it is that our mind can be transformed because the way it's usually acting out is, is not uh, part of its true nature. So, you know, we, 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 all of us can walk the path, but nobody can walk it for us. That's the main problem. <laughs> Otherwise you would hire someone to do it for you <laughs> and dedicate the merit in our direction. And our <laughs> So 
we all have to work as hard as we can, you know, in a happy way, not stressing ourselves out. But, yeah. <laughs> 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 this is why it's very important to, to recognize that um, it, you know, the, of course the path of transforming our mind, recognizing our true nature and so on forth is extremely important. But all these other things are also important, like cultivating kindness and generosity and patience and things like this. These are also, <coughs> so long, it's, it's a package deal. You know, it, it's all part of it. But all of these qualities, every one of them, we, we have to make efforts to, to cultivate them. <laughs> Otherwise it all stays up in our head, you know? We know all the definitions and we know the various subcategories and so forth and so forth. But it's all stuck up here, it doesn't go down here. And until it comes down into, into the center of our being, nothing really transforms. It's all just a very interesting intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. And so this is why we need our daily life. Because our daily life gives us the opportunity to try again and again and again and again. Until finally it becomes spontaneous. Until finally we've got it. Because all of these qualities are, are who we really are. This is what we are trying to express that our negative qualities are not our true nature, our positive qualities are our true nature. So therefore, however much we are habituated to negative aspects of our, our personality, they are not inherent within us. They can be changed. All of it can be changed. And, you know, the, the path is about, is about transformation. And if we want to have meaning to our life, that's what it is. That we have this life in which to transform. Because only that way are we really going to be of benefit to ourselves and of benefit to others on a deeper level. We have to transform. We cannot start worrying about changing other people. We cannot change other people. We have a hard enough time trying to change ourselves. But that is the only person that we really can effectively change. It's not a matter of changing. Change yourself, change the world. I mean, that's where it's at. As long as we are inside, in conflict, how can we talk about peace? As long as inside we have uh, even the idea, well, I want peace, but those people out there don't want peace. Mm -hmm. And so immediately we're back to us and them. We're the goodies, they're not they're the baddies. Then where is there going to be peace? So each one of us, you know, we are on a journey. And as long as we keep walking, however long it takes, it's worthwhile. It's when we just stop and sit down and say, that's it, I can't go. Or we go backwards. You know, His Holiness has this saying, um, which I'm sure some of you have seen, about never give up. And they've even put it on T-shirts. Um, but it, I, I don't have it with me, so I can't quote it. But it's, it's very beautiful. Um, from some talk which he gave, which was about just keeping going no matter or what obstacles are there, what difficulties we have. 
as long as we don't give up, it's okay. And so, I mean, for him, of course, he's also thinking in his mind, Tibet, and, you know, how to bring peace to Tibet, just as you are thinking how to bring peace to Israel. <coughs> and the forces against it seem so heavy and so insurmountable, but never give up. really believe that eventually truth will out. Eventually. You know, from the point of view of eternity, this is such a very small time. And the thing is, with our spiritual practice, and with our, our aspirations and desires for a happy planet, a happy nation, a happy neighborhood, a happy family, a happy person. All of it depends on never giving up. And every step is a step forward, however long it takes. I mean, we have had many struggles also in the Tibetan tradition for females to be recognized to be given the opportunities which for millennia they had been denied. And we weren't fighting with anyone. We were going forward every time, <coughs> creating opportunities, trying to move things slowly, slowly. And now things really are moving. Just when you think, oh, we give up, suddenly it's all happening. So many of the things which we've been working for for 20, 30 years, suddenly it's happening. <coughs> so truly, you know, we, we have to have that faith. We have to have that belief that finally, you know, the light is stronger than the dark. Even darkness is a thousand years, you switch on the light, where has the darkness gone? So we always must be moving towards the light and not be afraid of the dark. <laughs> in our practice and in our social engagement. Because ultimately, really, you know, when I was... Um, I, w I was brought up as a, a spiritualist. I wasn't brought up really as a Christian, and I wasn't Jewish, but I was, my mother was a spiritualist, which meant that every, every week we had seances in our house. And we would, uh, one of our neighbors was a, a medium, so she would channel uh, various people who had died. And it was a very small group of neighbors, and it was happening in our house, so we knew nothing was being fake. Anyway, I'm not talking about that, but what I'm talking about is that people would ask the spirits, you know, like somebody's having an operation next week, please help them, and, you know, are they going to be okay, and, you know, this one is doing an exam, Can, will they pass, and, and this sort of thing. And at that time, I was about seven or eight, nine years old, but I already thought, you know, look, there, these spirits, they're on the other side. Maybe they have more of a clue than we do. Why don't we ask them something really important? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said, is there a God? <laughs> and they said, well, you know, we, we don't completely know. You know, we're just spirits. <laughs> <laughs> but the the word around the spirit world is <laughs> <laughs> that God is not a person. God is not someone up there, you know, pulling the strings and judging. God is not a person. But, ultimately, there is love, 
and light and intelligence. And I thought, yeah, I'll buy that. <laughs> and I think it's true. Ultimately, we are love and light and intelligence. Ultimately, the universe is love, is light, is intelligence. We should never forget that. However dark it may seem, <coughs> ultimately, light, love, intelligence. Maybe we end there for today and um, dedication. Ah!